Welcome to the final section of the course, Pisces. Pisces is the dreamer. It is the culmination of all the other signs in the zodiac. It is the Christ consciousness. It is the energy that we put ourselves through. It is the yin and the yang. The two fish chased each other around. It is how we face the world in our current eon. There are good, there is bad, and they play off of each other. And it's a continual cycle of life that occurs. So when we talk about Pisces, we talk about duality, completeness, sleep, and productivity, right? So some of the most powerful hours in the morning are just just before sunrise um, in that, that twilight because we have that dream essence still in us and we're still fresh from the day and we're just coming into, coming into our form. And this is kind of where we get great ideas and generate things um, where we can start acting in Aries when it comes, up, comes around next. So I want to talk about myths and I want to talk about enlightenment, enlightenment, because when we talk about stories and Neptunian influences and Hollywood and all these energies that really are very, um, at least Neptunian, if not Pisces specifically. Um, so Neptune is Pisces ruling planet. As we start to create that energy and really let that happen, we start to act as if, right? There's, a, there's an acting process that occurs and we become what we're acting. It's not so much that we're faking it, it's that we're becoming something totally different than what we were previously. And myths tell us the direction that we want to go, right? We have um, stories that we tell ourselves and these stories evolve over time. So take the story of the solar system. We kind of start, we have this concept that we're a globe and there is this paste of stars and moving things on the outside. So we're the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. Um, the, yeah, the Ptolemaic model of the universe, we have a concept of the sun goes around the earth and the moon goes around the earth and all the planets go around the earth and we start to build up this system and we have more and more complex circles um, where Mars specifically, um, they get really good at predicting it, but it's super weird, the number of circles, because everything's like a perfect circle. So it's like you have this perfect circle and another perfect circle, and it circles on top of circles on top of circles, which is kind of how calculus works now, but it's that, um, it's kind of like an excessive, like there's no concept of an ellipse, like a, something like an oval. Um, not that they don't understand what an ellipse is, but there's no concept that like this could, this could, this could naturally exist in nature. This kind of high point and low point of a, um, orbit is, is not something they're comfortable with. It either doesn't line up with their perfect vision of the heavens or whatever. And so... A lot of people challenge this and the first person to really successfully make headway is Copernicus and he doesn't do it in his lifetime. Um, he is, he writes it up, um, puts down theory and um, somebody finds it after he dies basically or he allows it to be published after he dies and it's not fantastic. It's just it's the first one that gets traction. Um, mm -hmm. Other people have had this idea before, and 
basically zero reaction from the church because they, right, it's just just an idea. Um, and then there's Galileo and Kepler that come into play. And Galileo is not that the church was against what Galileo was doing per se. It's just Galileo was certainly like reactionary to the church. And that really hurt him in a lot of ways. Um, but he was smart at the same time. So he uh, named the Galilean moons after the Medici brothers. And he knew where his, you know, he knew where his bread was coming from. And so he kind of worked that process out. And he started to, you know, with the telescope, he was able to, to prove that things orbit things that are not Earth. Now, I think at this point, you know, the big question is like, how do you know the size of, of Jupiter and what, if these things are solid objects or not? Um, that's interesting, right? Because it, they're just, they're just dots. Um, he observes Venus over time and he observes Jupiter over time. And it's really Venus, I think, that proves that this stuff is different size, right? It's because he draws Venus and he draws the phases of Venus and he says like, hey, this is like phases of the moon. And so Venus must also orbit the sun. Eventually other astronomers come along and start to understand elliptical orbits and how things work. Prior to these this time, there is a strong understanding of inclined orbits, which is interesting because the, the nodes of the planets are, are, at least of the moon, are well known because of the eclipses. As we slowly kind of create our understanding of the universe, we have like what we define as the planets coming into into shape. So the planets were just whatever moved in the sky. So the sun, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And that's all we knew about. Uranus is actually on the edge of our vision, but we didn't know about it until modern times. And we're in something that's bigger than we think it is as far as the the solar system. And now we have a concept of like, this is, these are physical places that you could hypothetically go to if you could get off the earth, right? So we understand that these are, these are things and they um, start, to, they circle around and we analyze what we think the paths of the planets are supposed to be. And we, with Uranus, we find that there is another planet out there, Neptune. Um, and with Neptune, there isn't a calculation that shows there's another planet out there, but we do the calculation wrong and think there is. And we, so we look for another planet beyond Neptune for hundreds of years. And we analyze the gaps in the planets and we say like, well, there should be something between Mars and Jupiter. There seems to be something, there's too much distance there. Um, which is another bogus calculation, but we look and there's Ceres. And so we have this thing. And so now we have, um, now we have nine planets. So we, ha and that, so, and we're like, well, the moon's kind of like the Galilean moons and the sun is big fiery, fiery objects. So now maybe we've got, maybe our planets are Mercury, Venus. What about earth? Earth is a planet. Like earth is what's, what makes earth different than the others? Earth, Mars, Ceres, Jupiter, uh, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And so we have this, this expanding concept and we keep looking around and we find Vesta and Palathus Athena and all these things in this area between Mars and Jupiter. 
maybe this is a different class of object, right? This is maybe this is different than what we've thought about before. So we come up with an asteroid designation, you know, and we've known about comets before, but we've always thought they were random and didn't really understand them. And again, during this, this time period, um, you know, Holly's comet starts to, we start to map out and start to get um, the concept that comets are on these long elliptical orbits. So now we have another class of objects. We have, I think comets actually come in before asteroids, but like, so we have asteroids, we've got planets, we've got stars, we've got, is the sun a star? We've got um, moons, you know, the Galilean moons, the moons around Saturn, our moon, the um, asteroids that um, Mars has captured. We start to find all these, all these things that start to to create this this model of a, of the solar system, and this is real science. This is what the process is going through. These dots that have been moving around are named after gods from Roman times for us. Other cultures had named them after their but gods, right? And so we have um, the story of the gods through um, that would give us the days of the week, right? We break that down. You know, if we have seven days of the week because there's seven celestial bodies. You know, if we have seven days of the week because there's seven celestial bodies. There's Sunday, the sun, moon day, the moon, uh, Tuesday. Uh, I think Tuesday's for Mars. And then there's like Wednesday and Thursday, Thor, Zeus. Um, and we start to Friday, Freya's day. Um, Saturday, Saturn, you have everything being kind of modeled. Our whole calendar system is modeled on how these things move around and connect and kind of go through the process. And what is this? This is this exterior. This is this expanding consciousness of life and understanding that we go through, through this kind of Piscean dream world, right? So, um, myth becomes science or science becomes myth and we start to we have this back and forth between these different entities why are we telling these stories and why do we kind of base everything out off of like what we're working with and it is that we are in a way creating our environment as we understand it right so somebody in the first or second century BC is going to have a certain understanding of how the world is and what that kind of celestial body is that circles the earth. And then somebody in our time is going to kind of have this kind of horrifying understanding that we are a speck within a speck within a cosmic web that expands further than we can possibly imagine. We start to get more and more powerful uh, telescopes and we start to realize that Andromeda is a galaxy, like the Milky Way is the galaxy. So all the stuff we see in that, you know, that band of dust that we see in the sky on our really dark night in a really dark place is is all stars and dust that are part of something that we're a part of and something like the Magellanic clouds like they orbit us but they're their own galaxies right they're much smaller but it is um they're their own things they're their own entities and then we keep looking for things like we keep looking for that planet that we think is out beyond the realm of Neptune and we find Pluto. Clive, Clive Combal goes through all those different plates and eventually sees this moving dot and identifies it as Pluto which eventually you know like the asteroids we get to a point where we're like oh there's a bunch of these things out here we have a new class of something um, and that is these um, trans-Neptunium objects, um, dwarf planets, 
we actually recal classify like series because it's kind of circular uh, into one of these kind of protoplanet type bodies. And they are cold and icy and really far out. And we visit Neptune and we visit Pluto with robots. And we find that Neptune's moon Triton looks a lot like Pluto. And there's these really interesting things and there's these dynamics that are happening on, on these bodies um, billions of miles away from the sun that we can't even understand. And then we, you know, most recently we've mapped out a lot of these trans-Neptunian objects. And again, we think there's something out there circling, circling the sun. You know, is it a, like a proto black hole? Is it a planet? Is it a, um, is it even there? Is it just something that happened? Right? So what's, what's that question look like? At, this point as of this recording we've looked at least set we've scanned at least 75 percent of the sky for what we in a uh, resolution that we thought we would find this mysterious body and it has not shown up yet so it's not not impossible but it's looking more improbable that this kind of trans neptunian planet that we have been seeking since the late 1700s is, is still not a thing. Um, obviously now we're, we're not saying that it's in the ecliptic, like we talk about in this course with astronomy and astrology, or really astrology, but we're, we talk about this, it's on an incline of like 30 degrees or something, or it's been, it was something that was, um, kicked out in the early solar system or something like that. We have all this mythology going back to how the planets did battle and what these um, gods did um, going back thousands of years. There's something called the Thunderbolts Project, which is kind of like woo-woo science. And... Um, they talk about how the planets interacted and clashed and does, did all these things. Um, and we're finding that, um, you know, and that, that there, it's called the electrical universe. And there's these electrical shocks that go through the planets. And the reason why we see the uh, Valles Marineris on Mars is because a giant lightning bolt like blasted into the planet and blew up the Ellis Marineris. Um, it is a stretch. It is a stretch. But what we are seeing as we start to see other solar systems um, through projects um, that basically just scare at, stare at sections of the sky and say, like, are, is, there, is there a possibility of being planets here? Um, in these other solar systems around these other stars. Um, what we are finding is that our solar system is quite unique and there was a lot of movement of the planets in the early solar system because we see it in other solar systems. And we see these large planets like Jupiter really close to their sun. And so these are one, probably the most, the easiest planets a spot but they're also quite common and so why didn't Jupiter move all the way down to our Sun and so the hypothesis is that Saturn reined it in and pulled it out and that somehow there was this interaction between Saturn and Jupiter which normalized the planets and kept us from getting blasted into the Sun and so there's all these these connections that start to form and there's this overrun of myth and science and connection that really needs to be explored and talked about. We have these religions and we have these beliefs that keep us in our lane a lot of time, right? So we have paradigms. And so we have a scientific paradigm that 
um, you know, astrology is and <laughs> like, like, and so there's resistance to entertaining the ideas of astrology. We have scientific uh, paradigm that the electrical universe, and so we don't entertain those ideas um, as much. Way more common the other way. You have like crazy like aliens have visited and I can talk to the aliens with my mind and all sorts of like really I can stretch I can stretch this a little more than makes logical sense right like these ideas are always worth exploring and going into and right when we talk about like ancient alien theory right that's like I used to love those History Channel movies, or I think they're just shows, and they go through the history and they connect it to how aliens um, made the pyramids or, or whatever. And we have to, I think one of the most powerful things that we can remind ourselves is Occam's Razor, right? The simplest explanation is usually the explanation, um, unless there's significant evidence otherwise, right? So. Really, you know, basically, unless it's more complicated than you think it is, it's the simplest explanation. And it's just a good way of functioning, right? Because there's, we can't process all of that. And so that's how, like, Pisces, Pisces and myth and science really kind of start to combine. And that brings us to the second topic of enlightenment. And... I've got five ideas about like how to be enlightened here and they're really quick and the first is to release so you take responsibility for what you can and you let go of the rest you know if something happens if you're able to um, put someone in a better place if you are if you need to quit a job if you need to um, you know, refund money if you need to, um, whatever, and you have that capability, you can, you can do that. And as you do that, you will be able to, um, and then you just let go of whatever you can't do. So, um, you might have a friend that needs, needs help or something and needs a place to live and you have a family and you're not really sure like if this friend would be great to have around your family so what you can do though is say you have 200 bucks you can put them up in a hotel for a night and say like hey i'm sorry like this is, this is my family i gotta protect them um here's what i have for you and then you just let it go and it's painful and your friend's not gonna be thrilled but it is something that kind of moves you to that next level of how we grow and how we how we do it. So you just take on whatever you can and screw the rest. Second step is understanding, right? So you're going to need to understand the feelings of it, everyone involved, especially yourself. How do you feel about the situation? How do the other people effective feel about the situation how do you go through this process and then you have to forgive right so you forgive that you're not able to maybe help out your friend as much as you wanted you forgive your um, family for maybe blocking what you wanted to do and you forgive your friend for being a f needy putting themselves in this situation right um, you really identify like you identify all those feelings and you, you you let them wash over you and you let them them go and you have that forgiveness which really gives you the freedom to go do the next thing and then you ask right so you can't you see this with um influencers right they reach out and they if there's a situation they can't deal with, they ask their fan base to contribute to something. You know, sometimes people are ha are wealthy enough that they sh 
should be doing more in the in the in the release process and they get some um, kickback but a lot of times it's they've done what they can and they're saying like all right what's what else is available right we can't do anything of our own volition entirely we always need someone else's help we have you know there are roads that help everything move around on the streets you didn't build the roads there is a house or apartment that you live in probably um some people definitely build their own houses but for the most part um you had some help there's so many things of the modern world that we um, rely on other people for and it you know if you don't ask you don't get and so you have to ask those questions and see if that's something that's available for you likewise if you create something like a course or a book you have to ask people to buy it um and then you accept you accept the situation as it is um and for everything it is um you say like i've done my best i can go through the process and you can always reassess the process overall and that's this is kind of like the cycle of enlightenment when we sit down and we meditate and we say like hey i'm giving up this time or this energy uh, to kind of let my mind settle that is that's this process in action right or you're accepting that you're in a particular spot and you need to take some time for yourself and as you really grow and go through that process that is where we go and so I've really enjoyed making this course for you and I hope you enjoyed going through all the modules and that it's been really successful for you and that you feel like you learned a lot definitely feel free to um, send me an email reach out you know this is the the first course that I'm making and I have had a absolute wonderful time and I really appreciate feedback so um, I look forward to it. Um, I hope to work with you more in the future. And so obviously if you're watching this five years in the future, like I may have a different amount of availability, but right now I would absolutely love to hear from you um, and be in communication. Reach out and add comments and I hope everything is wonderful for you.